Here is a lecture for allergies and anaphylaxis. We'll also cover a little bit of A and P and pathophysiology for the immune system. Um, this is a lecture to be taught to uh, a new paramedic class that is in the uh, advanced EMT uh, portion of the course. We'll talk more about allergies, anaphylaxis, and immunology uh, later on in Medical Emergencies 1. Paramedics should realize um, that we can make quite an impact on the anaphylactic shock patient. Uh, starting an IVs, to caring for their airway, giving epinephrine and then Benadryl, uh, something like solumedra, all of those kind of important factors in uh, tamping down the morbidity associated with anaphylaxis. As far as epidemiology goes, there's only around 1,500 deaths a year in uh, the United States from uh, anaphylaxis. It's important for us to be able to differentiate anaphylaxis versus a simple allergic reaction. Um, and we'll have to do that much more often. We're going to be called to a moderate allergic reaction much more often than we would to a, a pure uh, anaphylaxis, which would be a life-threatening emergency. When we're dealing with the allergies and anaphylaxis, um, this would be the immune chapter, all right? The immune systems or the immunology chapter in some books. And that is the way that we deal with uh, foreign substances that have somehow entered our body. And so we're going to be using terms like antigen and allergen and things of that sort. An antigen is any substance, it's basically, we could say, we could break it down to a protein, any pro protein that um, has a substance or form that uh, is recognized by the body as being non-self, and then we have a reaction to it, all right? So with an antigen, we will uh, build an antibody towards that. When we're talking about an allergen, um, that is an antigen that causes an allergic response. And so we see those with uh, insect bites, with stings, uh, some medications, penicillin being a big one. Um, and then people are allergic to plants and foods and chemicals, all kinds of different things that I'm sure you've heard about. So how do these antigens make their way into our body? Think about that. It's almost the uh, pharmacology um, or medication administrations chapter um, question. How do antigens get into our body? And that is all of those same ways, which would be the inject, uh, injection, ingestion, inhalation, and absorption. The, uh, when, when something does get into our body, uh, the first thing that might happen is a white blood cell, which aren't very good at figuring out self and non-self, but they're good enough, all right? They're kind of the big guys, uh, a big army of uh, things that will come and uh, destroy, hopefully destroy, uh, what is non-self. So when it sees a bacteria or a fungi or something like that, it can identify it as, hey, this guy is supposed to be in the neighborhood. It'll go over there and engulf them. So these are macrophages. Uh, when, we, when we're recognizing them as white blood cells, they would be called a monocyte. So a monocyte turns into a macrophage. So after this macrophage uh, basically beats up or kills, sequesters um, the uh, foreign invader, um, it will basically die, uh, become less useful, and make its way to a lymph channel. And the lymph channel will carry it through to a lymph node. At the lymph node, B cells, all right, so in our immune system we have T cells and B cells. The B cell will form an antibody. All right, so B cells form antibodies. And the different antibodies that we have available to us are IgA, IgD, IgE, IgM, and IgG. Those all have different roles, and we don't really have to know uh, anything particular about any of those. If it matters to you, we can spell out the word damage there. All right, the D A M A G E, those are all the different antibodies. 
the one that we're only concerned about is the IgE antibody. And this is kind of important to, to understand. IgA, IgD, IgM, and IgG, none of those have anything to do with allergic reactions and anaphylaxis. We're only talking about the IgE antibody. This is the one that is formed um, when you are now going to have an allergy, an allergic. Uh, so if I come across, or let's say when I was a baby and I came across peanut butter, um, I may have formed antibodies to the peanut. All right, but it wasn't an IgE antibody. Other people um, who are now known as um, known to have an allergic reaction to peanuts, those people formed IgE antibodies. Those IgE antibodies then um, are going to uh, seek out uh, basophils and mast cells, and they would kind of cling to those. And, uh, and the antibody, what it does now, now that uh, you are sensitive to uh, whatever foreign invader you had, um, that antibody is going to look for that antigen again. So each antibody has um, a specific role to look for a specific antigen. You've heard about this kind of stuff before when we just talk about like, um, the uh, immunizations that you might have had. The way immunizations work is the uh, pharmaceutical industry comes up with the way an antigen looks um, and we inject that antigen into your body and then your body will then uh, form antibodies that will uh, react to that same antigen. So the next time that you come across a similar looking antigen, which would be the, let's say the flu virus, uh, you will be able to more quickly recognize that this is a problem and then uh, and mount a defense, all right? So when I talk about B cells, uh, I think of B cells and then antibodies, I think of them as the reconnaissance platoon, all right? Stay platoon, re, uh, force recon, however you wanna look at that. Those guys are out there looking for um, the bad guys. And it might be important to remember that each one basically has a kill card for each antigen. So we have a whole bunch of different antibodies that are looking for all of the different antigens that we have. And um, specifically when we're talking about allergic reactions, um, this is an IgE antibody that may be looking for something that we don't really want to be allergic to, but uh, for some reason we formed an IgE antibody and now we have that allergy. So um, histamines are inside those basophils and mast fills that we saw on that earlier slide. All right, so a basophil is a white blood cell. Those are cruising all over. They're white blood cells, so they're cruising all over our vessels. And then a mast cell looks the same, same kind of thing, a basophil and a mast cell, very much alike, but the mast cell is in tissue. Again, hanging out, antibodies on it. And then when a, our, that antigen enters our body, um, it will degranulate or um, you know, kind of destroy the cell wall. And the granules within inside the mast cell or basophil will be released. And the big one that we're talking about is histamine. Later on, we'll learn more, but right now we just need to know histamine. Histamine is a super um, vasodilator. So put those two together. Histamine, vasodilation. Um, I wouldn't mind if you just learned that. All right, we'll talk about more things about histamine, vasodilation. That's his main thing. And so uh, what the histamine would do in our nose, vasodilation in our nose causes our nose to run and it causes our airway to get smaller. All right, that's kind of an important thing. You'll hear me say that over and over again, um, maybe not today, but overall. When we vasodilate in our nose, our airway gets smaller. When we vasoconstrict in our nose and our upper airway, our airway gets bigger. That's why like if we were to squirt a little bit of epinephrine into a nose, like neosinephrine, um, we would get vasoconstriction and it makes our nose bigger. 
uh, not a bad thing to squirt a little bit of neosinephrine in a nose before you put an NPA in there. So these histamines are useful. Um, we have um, sites within our eyes that have um, histamine receptors, and when when we get a, a problem that we have something in our eye, boom, we'll we'll have a bunch of tears, and it'll bring the things out out of our eyes. So um, histamine is made to basically help us get rid of foreign invaders. All right. So good when it happens in small areas. All right. We'll talk a lot more about this with the inflammatory effect. Um, and then the, it is dangerous, though, when we have uh, the whole body releasing histamine. All right. And we have an overreaction then. So when we're talking about these chemical mediators, they can cause a systemic problem all over the place, or it could just be a local effect. So here's kind of a visual for this. Um, again, what has to happen is first, we have a primary response. We were um, exposed to, we'll go with this picture, we were exposed to a bee sting. For most of us, that was not a big problem, it hurt. Um, it might have caused a welt there, um, and then that went away. But other people, um, when they got stung by a bee, they saw this new antigen as fairly dangerous and something that we should produce an IgE antibody for. So they produced IgE antibodies. Those IgE antibodies went around. They kind of stick to mast cells and basophils. And now the next time when they get stung by a bee, that's what we're seeing in this picture here. The um, poison or toxin that a bee would uh, inject in us, that would be then seen by one of the basophils or a mast cell. In this picture, it's a mast cell. That When that happens, when we have antigen, antibody, and basophil or mast cell together, the mast cell will degranulate, and that's going to release all the chemical mediators, all right? And those chemical mediators are going to cause bronchospasms in our lungs, vasoconstriction. Remember, number one thing, vasoconstriction, sorry, um, vasodilation should be the number one thing, all right? But it causes vasoconstriction in the lungs. Um, again, vasodilation in the blood vessels, leakiness. So you vasodilate so much that it causes there to be a um, increased permeability in the when you were getting down to the capillary area. So if you have increased permeability way down in the capillary area, we're going to lose fluid there. All right, and so fluid will always flow through the path of least resistance. And where this seems to be the, one of our biggest problems then is one, we're going to get those that pruritus and urticaria, the edema that we see in the skin, but we're also going to see what's called angioedema, and that's going to be swelling in the face, and that ends up causing some upper airway issues. Something we don't really need to know about a lot, but um, Histamine also affects your heart, so we'll have decreased cardiac output too. All of those happening all at the same time when we're talking about anaphylaxis. So here we are, we're going to have three different um, categories basically of allergic reaction. The first one is a mild uh, allergic reaction, and I think the big thing that we should think about here is the word local. All right, so a mild allergic reaction is local. So it's just one part of your body. Um, so it doesn't need to be local like pinpoint. It's just one part of our body, like here we see across the back, um, across the toes. Um, when it's just uh, one area, it really is probably going to be an allergic reaction that would be, react that would be char characterized as mild, kind of easy to take care of. The patient wouldn't be short of breath. If we're going to call it a mild allergic reaction, they're not short of breath. These signs and symptoms usually develop over minutes, um, uh, not seconds, all right? So maybe a little bit right away, but they can actually develop over a period of time that's longer than an hour. So in a moderate allergic reaction, um, here we're going to see uh, maybe two different things, two different things that are a change. One is systemic, 
all right instead of being local we're going to think of it as being systemic number two is where are we talking so it might be local but in an area that we with that we would recognize as vulnerable something that is going to cause a problem with our airway so as we're looking at these two patients here um, we see like the person has a swollen lip and then the um, the little kid probably a three-year-old there has a swollen lip and then a teenager above uh, in, lower in the corner there um, she has uh, swollen eyes, probably swollen lips, and um, what you would call angioedema. So these would become at least a moderate allergic reaction because we're now going to be worried about their airway and leaning towards anaphylaxis maybe uh, when we're really worried about their airway. So when we're dealing with anaphylaxis, now we have something where we have an airway problem. All right, so that could be strider, that could be just severe wheezing and inability to breathe well. And then cardiovascular problems, that the number one thing that we would be looking at is uh, a low blood pressure then. So it's important for us to say, all right, this person really needs treatment or this person doesn't really need treatment because the treatment that we bring as paramedics is pretty um you know, it's pretty dangerous to be given to the wrong person. So some symptoms that we'll see for, let's say with anaphylaxis, is itching all over, their body will be flushed, um, and maybe in some places they could have some pallor, but uh, overall we would be thinking flushed because they vasodilate, all right? Hypotension, laryngospasms, which we would be thinking of strider then, bronchospasms, that would, would go with wheezes, and we would be thinking like that persistent cough or itchiness in the back of the throat. Those would be the things that we would worry about. The patient can have abdominal cramping, bloating, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, all of those, all right? They could have a headache because there's actually histamine sites there and then dizziness, all right? Runny nose, itchy, swollen eyes, angioedema, swollen all over the place. Um, Sex things because uh, they can cause an anaphylactic reaction in such a rapid way uh, deserve special mention here. All right. So here, when they get stung by a bee or a scorpion, maybe ants, um, here we'll have itching and burning. We'll have a wheel uh, where the insect uh, bit or stung them, uh, then swelling, especially in the area, and then possibly all over the body, chest tightness and coughing right away, abdominal cramps. And again, here we're looking at symptoms that um, progress fairly quickly. And the, the insect that can cause these are um, are called hymenopteras, all right? So honeybees, honeybees can only sting you once. They have a barb in their stinger, and then when they, after they sting you, they fly away and leave the um, barbed stinger under the, under the skin. Wasps and hornets, they can sting repeatedly, and then that would also mean they're not going to leave that stinger there. Ants also strike repeatedly, and they can also inject a, um, a venom, and, it, and sometimes that'll happen. Boom, they'll brush, this, they'll brush everything off, and then several minutes later, all of a sudden, they, they're starting to see the, um, the problems associated with an allergic reaction in that area, and then it can go systemic. So uh, not all signs and symptoms have to be present for every allergic reaction. We're only needing a few for that mild, more probably for moderate. And then, uh, and then when we're talking about anaphylaxis, we really just need to have a low blood pressure. That's all you really need when uh, you know you have everything else in place. Which you're probably going to have other things like the pruritus or something that gives you the idea that you're in an allergic reaction. But if you have strider and okay blood pressure, that would still be probably thought of as anaphylaxis. So um, maintain a high index of suspicion with patients who say that they're allergic to stuff, um, and that should be, you know. And a high index of suspicion that they're going to have a bad allergic reaction, but you also have to stop and think, you know, is this person panicked? All right, is this maybe a hyperventilation syndrome because last time the person nearly died? So uh, it is important to distinguish uh, between the two.
And so when you're first starting to take care of the patient, you're going to do your ABCs. Again, be super cognizant of any airway noises, whether that's strider or wheezing. Um, make sure the patient can sit upright or in the position that they want to. You'll want them sitting upright. Um, try and get a good history while you're putting them on oxygen. So that's going to take you for take you a little while. If you know they got stung by a bee, early on we want to limit how much of that poison gets into the into the body. So we're going to remove the allergen. Typical way that we learned as an EMT, we're going to brush something like an ID card or a credit card across the skin, and it'll and it'll kind of flick out. We're not supposed to use something like uh, hemostats because it will squeeze a little bit more stuff into their skin. Once removed, we wash with soap and water so we get every bit out of there. And then um, ice in that area is good too, all right? Uh, that will limit the amount that is going to be immediately brought in. So ice is going to cause vasoconstriction, limiting how much is going to quickly get brought into the system. When we now remember, we have to do a bit of you know history and physical exam. By we're doing that, we're going to put the person on oxygen. When we uh, decide that and this is anaphylaxis, then we're going to probably get out our EpiPen, all right, either the patient's or our own, and administer uh, our Epi, all right, 0.3 milligrams deep IM. It's good to go in the big muscles of the thigh because we still have good vasodilation there, all right. Uh, not vasoconstriction. We have good vasodilation there. So, um, and then we're going to be treating the patient for shock, all right? Uh, that may mean laying them down if we have to. We're going to have to make a bit of a, a decision regarding is it uh, better for them to sit up for their breathing or should we be laying them down for their shock? Maintain their body heat by keeping them covered. Start an IV and don't be afraid to give them 20 milliliters per kilogram. You want to initiate transport early. Um, there are two more drugs that are really important, and that would be Benadryl. So if we're working as advanced DMTs, um, getting ALS there may be useful. Um, and then uh, and then Solumedrol, which Solumedrol is useful uh, to give early, but it really doesn't have a great impact until about four hours or so. And there's other drugs also like H2 blockers and other things. So uh, one thing that I like to talk about here as we're on the ALS side of emergency care, a lot of people want to jump to the idea that we should be intubating a patient, all right, or putting it in an advanced airway, thinking that that's going to be a great use. Um, now we, the thing that we really want to do, we think of the EpiPen as an airway device, EpiPen airway device because we always want to prioritize airway epi pen airway device all right now the reason that i say that is to try to uh, if we put in basic airways and supraglottic airways we haven't fixed the issue because they still can swell up around their uh um, in that uh, supraglottic area and limit the amount of air that's going to pass. Trying to do a nasal intubation on the patients are going to be is going to be very difficult because they're in anaphylaxis. So all of those airways will have a bunch of vasodilation. Vasodilation makes the airway smaller, so you'll have to be using smaller tubes and nasal intubation in the smaller tube doesn't make sense. All right, it just doesn't like to maintain a curve that will get you into the um, glottic opening. If you decide, well, no, you know, I think the way to fix them is uh, is maybe start an IV, knock them down, and then intubate them. Well, heck, what you want to do is start giving them epi. All right, uh, epi will will help you fix the problem. You don't want to spend a lot of time and effort trying to do an advanced airway when uh, getting them epinephrine will fix the problem. Another thing that people will jump into sometimes because of um, magnesium sulfate being so awesome for asthma is some people will get um, tricked into thinking that um, magnesium sulfate might be good for this patient. Magnesium sulfate is a smooth muscle relaxant. That's why it works for the asthma patient. Um, this person already has that, all right? 
Uh, so giving meg sulfate to somebody with a low blood pressure is going to be harmful. So that's off the table. It's all about EpiPens uh, and maybe IV fluids, Benadryl and Solumedrol later. Um, and uh, as we get into paramedic care, we'll talk a little bit about giving um, uh, glucagon. Um, it might be a little too confusing right now, uh, but glucagon also has uh, a potential of helping when we don't want to give uh, an EpiPen to a patient. Um, and that is it for our uh, anaphylaxis and allergic reaction. 25 minutes, not too bad. Um, and all of this was good information. Thanks.